Welcome back to today's second session on protecting and restoring our future. We're going to continue exploring the idea that nature can provide us with a planetary safety net to supply clean water, abundant food, and safety from disasters. Let's get started with this video from youth activist Mariam Belal Mohamed. One day, I'll be an elder. I see myself with wrinkled eyes, telling my story to a group of young people. I tell them of how we almost got to the pricking point as a planet, and how we climb back to safety by repairing and protecting our natural systems, by changing our relationship with the planet. One of the major contributors to the climate change is agriculture. <laughs> They completely grow their crops on the rainwater. It's a completely greenhouse gas free agriculture. And most of all, it is the most nutritious food that it produces. 60% of tropical deforestation, more than 32 football fields per minute, is caused by only three food commodities beef, soy, and palm oil. Today, the way we manage resources for energy, for materials, for water and especially for food is leading to a planetary breakdown. Our planet is in a state of emergency. Both climate change and the loss of biodiversity have devastating consequences. We've lost so much biodiversity already. 70% in just the last 50 years and 1 million species will be extinct by 2050. Biodiversity loss is an urgent threat to health, food supplies, and livelihoods across the globe. But there are reasons for hope. More than 100 governments have agreed to protect over 30% of their lands and waters by 2030. I endorse the Leader's Pledge for Nature. I endorse the Leader's Pledge for Nature. And commit to take urgent actions. Urgent actions. Urgent actions. So that the United. 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 We can reverse biodiversity loss. By 2030. By 2030. For sustainable development. Our life support system, the network of life on Earth that sustains our every breath, stands at the center of the biggest issues the world faces. As we hold the levers, do we allow our natural systems to flourish and regenerate, to continue to supply us with multiple benefits in a variety of ways, or do we choose the path unrestrained, that of unsustainable human activities, of overexploiting nature and running it to the brink of extinction? I would like to share with you a Sami story that was told to me by my mother and grandmother. Since the beginning of time, the humans and reindeer made an agreement that the reindeer would provide for us everything we need. Our food, our clothing, our transportation, our security, and even our worldviews, teaching us our ways. And in return, we should provide for the reindeer pasture lands throughout the year and protect the reindeer from predators. And in this way, we agreed to take care of each other always. And this agreement cannot be broken. And it illustrates the need of being respectful with nature. And it warns us what happens if we are not. Because breaking this contract means that we will cease to exist. We 
have a duty to preserve the biodiversity of life on earth as conserving nature is not just a moral issue but it is also a question of survival. We are all agents of change. We can lead the transition away from unsustainable consumption and production. We can mobilize more partners along the way to help redirect and repurpose resources, to reverse biodiversity loss and put it on a path to recovery. And collectively, we can empower the transition with the engagement of all society, including indigenous peoples and local communities, youth, women groups, and many others. We're coming together, a network of people working in different ecosystems to restore our planet. It's not all about harvesting. You have to give back, so you always, you don't harvest everything all at once. You always leave a little. One day, I'll be an elder, and I'll tell the story of our survival to my great-grandchildren. What story will we tell yours? Let's dive into the first segment, focusing on restoring forests, restoring our future. Forests provide half of our oxygen, are home to 80% of life on Earth, and are one of our most important allies when it comes to climate change. Let's hear from different forest restoration initiatives around the world. The people that are being tasked with restoring our natural world don't have the tools necessary to address the industrial scale landscape degradation we see today. Right now, there are more than 2 billion hectares of degraded land around the world. We need to fix this, fast. Tree planting activities have spiked over the last few years, all in response to the increased understanding of the consequences of land degradation and the potential to sequester large amounts of carbon in our fight against climate change. But planting trees is not enough. We have to make sure that they grow as expected, the native species are thriving, and that the invasive species are under control. Monitoring with precision is a critical element to restoration projects, yet in recent research by Yale University and the Nature Conservancy, it was reported that only 18% of planting organisations are currently monitoring their efforts. We have a responsibility to protect and restore our environment, but how can we be expected to succeed when we don't have the critical tools we need? Dendra Systems' vision is to empower humanity to restore the balance of our natural world by creating the tools needed to scale ecosystem restoration. We provide the infrastructure to monitor environmental projects at scale and the platform to drive interventions that are needed. Using a combination of drone technology and ecology trained AI, we can capture and analyze massive amounts of data and generate new insights to direct restoration work, monitor ecosystem health, and seed large biodiverse ecosystems. We are now capable of bringing consistent governance and transparency for all the environmental projects across each nation and put us on track for the journey towards 2030 goals. Without a massively scalable approach to restoring ecosystems, we cannot address the scope of the damage. Dendra's mission is to scale ecosystem restoration and quantify biodiversity and carbon, all in order to deliver against the goals that the world is trying to achieve through nature-based solutions that restore this beautiful, natural world. Cuando eso fue, no había mucha ganadería. Más bien la gente se, se sostenía era con el producto de bálsamo. Y no quedó ni un palito, se murieron. Porque han deforestado tanto. Es un árbol que crece hasta 20, 25 metros. Él es de montaña. Para esa recolección se fabricaban una, unas escaleras. Y con el lomo le daba. Y ahí lloraba. 
tiene uno que dejarle que no lo encuentre con el machete. El báltamo tiene venas como la gente. Si se hace una lingüeta en forma de B, ahí se apoya la, la coca. Cuando yo peladito y yo oía a la gente poniendo, yo dije, yo también voy a poner báltamo. Cuando aprendí tenía cinco años. Y entonces fue donde estaba un tipo que compraba báltamo. Yo le dije, don Francisco, yo tengo báltamo puesto. Un sombrero, un par de zapatos y, y una muy de ropa, nuevecito, salió fue vestido. Un potecito de una libra le llevaba en cachica. Total, que le pagué? Y así fue. Todas las cosas son así. Mis ancestros, ellos eran recolectores de bálsamo. La vaca de los pobres, el bálsamo, o yo. Esto fue la zona donde había bálsamo en cantidad. Hi everyone, the Global Youth Coalition is delighted to present today the Reforesting for Peace project. This last year, we have experienced more than ever the effects of climate change, contaminated ecosystems, heat waves, floods. These last ones, for example, have claimed more than 57,000 lives in the last past decades. Therefore, we must rethink how we deal with social and climate crisis, because a lack of captivating and conscious content can lead to disconnect the climate guardian's efforts from public perception. Reforesting for Peace addresses this issue by leveraging filmmaking and social media to inspire a global movement to bridge the gap and to empower youth to drive impactful climate action. With this, as part of the GYC capacity building strategy, we aspire to empower youth, climate scientists and NGOs to use the tool of filmmaking. Amnesty International, Greenpeace and Oxfam are some examples of how filmmaking has an impact on the support and involvement we get. Oxfam mentioned that the film I Am Hope increased the donations to the organization by 15%. Not every organization has the capacity or equipment to create a high-quality content and raise awareness around their ongoing solutions. Our plan is pretty ambitious but necessary. We will train 5,000 youngsters with movie-making skills for cool content creation and connect them with 500 NGOs on ongoing solutions. They will receive proper equipment from our side. Empowering and gearing up NGOs and youth leaders in the front line will make it possible to create popular content and 500 real their youth, local organizations and climate scientists uniting their strengths to combat climate change effectively. With a comprehensive curriculum, Reforesting for Peace will seek to educate young individuals about the art of filmmaking, enabling them to create compelling content and inspire fundraising campaigns for climate action we aim to create short movies and cool reels that raise awareness about environmental issues and ongoing nature-based solutions. Inspiring those individuals who may just not be interested in the matter. And while our plans seem ambitious, we've already demonstrated our ability to make a difference with global projects. Take our Global Youth Oxford Net Zero training program as an example. We trained 5,000 individuals through 13 sessions live interpreted in four languages. And our first session had an outreach of 13,000 views. Now enjoy our promotional video. Reach us out. Take action at theglobalyouth.co. Entire neighborhoods wiped out by sudden catastrophic flooding. Southern Europe is braced for more record-breaking temperatures this weekend as a heat wave there. One million species of animals and plants around the world are now at risk of extinction. <laughs>
Hello, I'm John Lotzbeach, Executive Director for Train Trees. I'm so pleased to be able to join the Nature for Life Hub to share how we're helping to build nature positive economies. Tree and Trees is a joint venture between BirdLife International, Wildlife Conservation Society, and WWF. These organizations came together because they knew there was an urgent need to speed up and scale up forest conservation to protect and restore these critical ecosystems. We focused our efforts on quality intervention in high impact areas to meet the delicate balance between people and nature in order to find solutions for forests that can work for all and work for the long term. Forests matter for three main reasons, for people, for nature, and for climate. There are lots of pledges and global commitments who are trying to get us there. People recognize how important forests are, and nations have embraced the need for large-scale forest restoration. This has all been amazing to see, but these commitments and pledges are not enough. We have to see a real shift in implementation and delivery because our time is running out fast and we know that some tipping points could become inevitable very, very soon. So while we have to accelerate forest protection and restoration efforts, we absolutely cannot sacrifice quality over quantity, particularly in restoration. If we don't get it right and restore the right trees in the right places, with local communities taking the lead, then we will not succeed. Maintaining high standards for nature and for people and ensuring that the benefits are fairly and equi equitably distributed is crucial. So that suggests we need a new type of financing. Why is that? Well, right now, large and small environmental organizations are leading the charge, de delivering amazing impact from individual actions that are helping to address the severity of both the climate and the biodiversity crises. But most of these groups are based on charitable donations and deliver with small proportions of government funding. Transformational change at the scale we need needs landscape, forest landscape restoration, initiatives that move beyond philanthropic support. Financing needs to come from both the public and private sectors, with both sectors recognizing that more investment in nature now means better economies in the future. Of course, some financing mechanisms already do exist and, and they can provide funds in return and do provide for environmental services. These include things like water companies supporting restoration because it improves quality, increases supply or restores or restore mangrove forests in coastal areas because fish use these waters, which in then turn support healthy fisheries, which then communities depend on for income and food. And these are great models. The, they, these payments are, are made for outcomes which can use market mechanisms to potentially go to scale and attract private sector finance, which allows public and philanthropic funds to go further or to be deplored more strategically. But it's not as easy as it sounds just replacing market with philanthropic because these efforts are so scattered and we need to find a way to bring them together in a more coherent way. To access this type of sustainable financing, early stage restoration programs do need some help to overcome three significant barriers. First, long-term local and government engagement, which means building partnerships with lots of different stakeholders and people Partnerships that can endure a political change, for example. Second, this kind of financing depends on robust business plan and feasibility studies. Have all the risks been explored? Will the plan work for multiple years? Are the community locally benefits integrated throughout? This requires a set of skills that maybe some of our organizations don't yet have, and we should help them get there. Finally, investors need accountability and clear metrics of success. Only then can they be assured of best practice and that we can track their investments. This also requires an upfront funding, which also like venture capitalism does not always guarantee 100% success, but is a bet on nature. So what is our version of doing this? Well, to address these challenges, Tree and Trees has within our landscapes created what we call a landscape restoration catalyst. 
This catalyst is aimed at kickstarting the development of large-scale forest restoration initiatives, which can help bring millions of hectares into restoration potential in a way that is both equitable and has a potential to last. The catalyst helps projects to build, test, and deliver financing for restoration rather than restoration itself. And this mechanism starts with four principles. First, we prioritize landscapes where we believe will have the greatest potential of success, mostly because they have government buy-in, but also because of the framing and filter that we do, which I'll talk about in a moment. Second, this needs absolute definition of what the benefits can be so that as we find the financing, we know we're gonna get at the end. Third, we need to be clever about financing, not public or private, but a blended stacked model where this can support early stage project development with grant funding, for example, so that we can move to market as we go. And finally, the financing mechanism must be replicable using templates so that we can take it to different projects and different geographies. A good living example of this is Mount Kenya, where the forest provides a significant amount of water to the Tana River system, which is one of the five keys water towers in the, in the Kenya area, in the Nairobi area. Forest restoration could improve soil conservation and water protection in Mount Kenya, which would then improve the condition of water in the downstream catchment. This means that there are around 6,200 hectares of land for potential forest restoration on local community and government land. And this project then implements a payment uh, system that allows this mechanism to fund the upstream so that the benefits also accrue to downstream users. So what do we need to do for our catalyst to work? Well, we looked at forest restoration opportunities on a global scale. Our global analysis provides the basis for potential restoration. Successful delivery, however, depends on local context and knowledge. In other words, no restoration in our program should move forward without the consent and involvement of local stakeholders, stakeholders so that support for restoration can be targeted to local communities and indigenous tribes, for example. And here's the exciting bit. With more than a billion hectares of forest where tree and trees plant partners work, we identified more than 310 million hectares of land for high priority restoration. This means that catalyst landscapes can go where there is potential for transformational investment by the private sector. Our landscapes can kickstart forest restoration initiatives with globally significant climate contribution potential with sustainable growth for local communities. Of course, each landscape will have its own context and challenges, but what's interesting about Catalyst is that it will offer bespoke support for each of these communities to answer local context. So it's a really transformational way to think about financing large scale restoration that brings the three challenges that we started with into play. Do the benefits accrue you to the people, to the nature, and to the climate in a way that is what we would call win-win. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. If not us, then who? Tenemos tenido varias reuniones en las comunidades también. Una es discutir los problemas de las comunidades en temas de tierra, especialmente. Entonces, esta agenda de titulación, las comunidades ya comienzan a sentir que todos estos recursos, pues ya, ya no es directamente del Estado, sino que ahora también es de, es de los pueblos indígenas hacia eso.
Es está bajo manejo de la comunidad, no está bajo manejo del Estado, de, de, de una institución del Estado. Pero ahora que ya es, eh, ya es de la comunidad, del pueblo miquito, yo sé que se va a cuidar mucho mejor. La importancia de las aves que nosotros tratamos de hacerlo es que Barabah Liminarsa, tilbanarsa, winku wala, winku tara kum sawaika, tara brisa, baja sin narsa, e, sula narsa, taiwan buksa, e, kiaki, ban, no abu, e, baja ni sut narsa, winku satka ailal, barsa, wal yung mabaku, naha minit, naha trampa kamara wal, yana ni, baja dau kriba tilara, limisin, saki bang risa, yang luk na tilbasin. Es batana sirve usar para pelo, para, los, para el cuerpo, se usa bien y se cura. Blas y piora. Ahí está su vez, que la vez se cae agua, no va a pre-brican. Para ir a luz, para ir a la brisa. Para bajar pisca, si el pilpe va, y agua anda nan, un cuero, se pone un pilar de las que le dan para la lica. O sea que más allá, como de, de 8 kilómetros para allá, han llegado los colones acaparadores de tierra que han destruido el bosque y ya tenemos unos, unos baleados y otros, bueno, persiguiéndonos sobre los colones, que cuando nosotros decimos que no, ya no, que no, entonces esa es la amenaza que viene. Y siempre nos mantenemos así bajo, pero con el poder de Dios tal vez todavía estamos vivos. La guala, man, nada, nada, con esta sed, boama, con la guala, que va a ser más sistema para las boquivaras, sin manchur mis quiguaras, tuctan si quiguaras. Para Yangma y para Baba, ya era con lato, cuando viste la caixa. Yo me llamo a Luis Ataque, yo te me llamo a Luis No, me casas para que te llamas para tu quiera. Van a tu quiera, con sinti sermón, sinti sermón, porque Upla, con como Baba. No es que no podemos dividirnos como pueblo mezquito, y eso es lo que nos fortalece. A pesar de las intervenciones políticas, religiosas y otras, otras, otros procesos. Y hacia eso tenemos que encaminar, el de si perdemos nuestra identidad, eh, perdemos nuestra cultura, perdemos todo lo que tenemos. Pana pana iwan kapasigay sin na lato en la kibika, de iwan kumiki, de rasut pa lato en la kamista aslakan. No venitemo lai sin na misbarasa, ay britaw na misbarabako ay kaik sa kunapya, suri warait kai sa. Ora puan na siga. Nina Raúl no se ha traído mi tarea en el Vaco, ya. Ya, lo que es no es la copia que la que va a entrar. Ya, 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 Wetlands are the hidden heroes of the natural world. 
They help store and filter our drinking water, protect us from floods, and are teeming with life. This next segment on restoring wetlands, restoring our future, highlights the importance of wetland restoration and shows us different approaches for scaling of action. Let's take a look. Wetlands are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on our planet, supporting over 40% of the world's plant and animal species. However, we are losing wetlands at an alarming rate, threatening the life and ecosystems that depend on them. That is why action on wetlands in delivering the Global Biodiversity Framework is critical. Adopted by 196 countries, the GBF contains 23 targets to halt and reverse nature loss by 2030. Two targets explicitly mention inland waters, providing a powerful mandate for the inclusion of wetlands in national biodiversity plans. Protecting and restoring wetland ecosystems can help countries achieve many other targets of the GBF as well. Under the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, countries have designated over 2,400 wetlands as sites of international importance. These habitats, from the Sundarbans in India and Bangladesh, to the Parana Delta in Argentina, are critical to conserving 30% of our planet by 2030. Wetlands are home to many threatened species, some not found anywhere else in the world. Healthy wetlands are crucial for their survival. Wetlands are climate superheroes, enhancing water security, increasing coastal resilience and sequestering carbon providing a nature-based solution to climate change. The framework commits to dramatically increasing investment in nature and reducing harmful subsidies. Channeling finance into wetland projects provides a powerful way to meet these targets. By harnessing the power of wetlands to deliver the GBF, countries can build an equitable, carbon-neutral, nature-positive future. The time to accelerate action on wetlands is now. Recently, a group of 94 leading scientists and ecologists in 70 institutions from around the world reviewed 53 years of data, 1,800 time series in 22 European countries and found that despite all our efforts, freshwater ecosystem recovery has stalled in Europe. How did they get to that conclusion? They looked at freshwater invertebrate biodiversity, our most reliable indicator of freshwater recovery, and found that the more rare and sensitive species bear the brunt of pollution, excessive nutrients, bad water quality, climate change, and the invasion of non-native species, and the more sensitive invertebrates, the ones who contribute the biodiversity we need to thrive on this planet, they are not coming back. The overall abundance of invertebrates is improving, but the evenness of populations is increasing. More organisms, but fewer species. Bottom line, biodiversity and thus freshwater ecosystem recovery are not on a trajectory we'd like to see. Pretty depressing, you think? Well, we tend to figure that as individuals, what difference can we make? What difference can we really make? We tend to think that biodiversity degradation is a problem too big for any one person to do something about. Well, that just isn't true. There are a lot of successful individuals out there. EcoAdvance, 
a Horizon Europe project, is synthesizing the last 20 years of work in freshwater ecosystem restoration into an easy-to-use compendium to inspire more successful projects by giving advice to project funders and proposers on how to pick and design successful projects. By identifying and showcasing individuals, successful individuals in science and solutions that are bending the curve, EcoAdvance will bring guidance from personal journeys to support current leaders, scientists, and decision makers who face some of the same challenges and dilemmas the successful have already navigated. As they try to figure out, will this work? Is it worth the money, time, effort, and energy? Is it the right thing to do for our community and our circumstance? And most important, will it really make a difference? Individuals around the world are looking in the mirror. They're determining that they can make a difference and translating that determination into action. In a year-long study of 29 countries, EcoAdvance, a project funded by Horizon Europe, found that individuals drove significant improvements in systems, in infrastructures, in freshwater ecosystems, and in biodiversity. They have made a difference. Sure, many brought their organizations and governments and communities along, but it was not easy. Think about the young Avi, who just got his degree and was hired to implement the change in the water law in his country, allowing water to be allocated to restore nature. As he explains, the two major challenges he faced and still faces over a decade later. Uh, naturally, streams are the lowest point of every landscape. And all the pipes and all the uh, outlets are directed in their uh, direction. And uh, now we suffer even uh, streams that don't have chronic uh, uh, pollution are, are under a very heavy shadow of uh, 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 fallouts and um, and uh, breakouts in the uh, in the pumping station of the sewage, and we have a lot a lot of uh, uh, pollution uh, uh, events. Most of our alluvial streams were channelized and straightened and uh, lost most of uh, their natural uh, characteristics. And the major challenge now is to to take the the anthropogenic land use and to to take uh, uh, the development and, uh, and and save some room for the river because uh, all the land in Israel it is is parceled and uh, most of the, river, the uh, most of our streams doesn't have their own parcel and they're uh, free game and um, we have to work hard in order to uh, to keep them uh, functioning and alive one characteristic seen increasingly around Europe and with climate change will be seen globally is that streams are drying up. They run sometimes only once in a year uh, or uh, twice in a year in some, some areas. And in other uh, uh, days of the year, there are land that you can use, that you can build on, that you can uh, cult cultivate. And in uh, once in the in, uh, in the time, uh, there is a flood. So today, a matrix group of individuals from different government offices and disciplines meet regularly to funnel water to nature, to improve freshwater ecosystems, promote biodiversity, and preserve rare species. What was the big change? The sight of water running in, in a stream is, is whoa, we, we, we can use this water. Uh, why? why uh, why are these water just flowing to the to the sea? And I think today, uh, we, me and my colleagues uh, managed to to change that the sight of water running in the stream is not an absurd. It's it's the way it should be. And while individuals can make a difference and can change how people think, involving others and giving them ownership makes the difference sustainable long term. Here's Shiri, who orchestrated a restoration with the community and led the drive to turn a degraded reach into a community park that the community took as their own to preserve and protect. 
I think only individuals can do that. Uh, the thing is how you collaborate and how you bring them together to do that change and to make it. What we found in, in the way that we work, that when you um, bring the community that lives in this area, the, the citizens that lives next to the stream, and they have a sense of uh, belongingness to the stream, and they they in the they part of the the planning and part of the working and part of the restoration of the stream and they see how it, it comes together and how it makes from planning for uh, for reality uh the sense of belongingness that they have to this project to this stream to to this nature is much stronger and they help to keep it together can we do it the same way we always have no, of course not. Building more gray infrastructure won't do the trick. Listen to Karma. She is at the ICLEI, which supports local governments and the public servants who are at the forefront of both change and barriers to freshwater restoration in their efforts to achieve sustainability. She explains. I think we cannot uniquely look at the conventional approaches, but uh, we need to start accelerating the uptake of nature-based solutions managed in a, in a smart way for water pollution control, for rain uh, uh, retention, for um, also supply, as we need to have a more circular urban water system. And then there is Savas, a postdoctoral researcher in Cyprus, whose research led him to understand how a rare endangered species of Cyprus snake got a new start on the island after it was considered extinct for decades because of historic DDT use, used to rid the island of mosquitoes and malaria. Instead of trying to do large actions, large activities with huge budget that you, th you think could save biodiversity, you could have small actions, small individual, one by one persons doing Doing there's more uh, kind action in the nature to to help a reptile uh, or a bird or, or a small mammal to drink some water, and those actions uh, are, are the actions that are going to have the large impacts. And then there is Christoph, who, with over 20 years experience in hydraulics and sediment management in hydropower dams, working on optimizing and balancing energy and environment concerns. He subscribes to the strategy recommended by the esteemed group who called to re-energize freshwater restoration and recovery in Europe. And I quote, We call for adaptive environmental management that recognizes conservation and restoration objectives as shifting targets that can be modified to adapt to global change and maximize the protection of biodiversity. Now, Christoph also sees adaptive management as the key the willingness to learn while doing and adapt to the re dynamic reality that is our world. He sees power in action. All of these uh, restoration activities and also these uh, projects, they are, even if you're having a certain mindset, how you want to proceed in these projects, they're very site specific. And um, uh, my experience of how we are uh, approaching these restoration projects are uh, always like a very similar scheme. So having a, at the beginning, uh, this catchment scale perspective, we're doing, if it's possible, the modeling uh, for the entire river and then going specifically into the details. So this is a kind of general approach, starting with a project, but then it turns out due to this site-specific boundary conditions, um, how we have to change this general setting or to adapt this general setting. Right, and this is something we have always in mind that we have a kind of general approach at the beginning, but knowing that at a certain point of um, experience in the catchment, we have to decide to go different, different ways. And this, um, how to say, it gives us the flexibility from the early beginning to react to some of um, problems, troubles we have not had in mind at the beginning. And then, um, but with the opportunity to still move straight forward, right? And last but not least, consider Mark, who works to spread river culture in Ireland and Northern Ireland. 
They call it river trusts. And once launched by individuals, these become local charitable organizations that develop a vision for how they want their freshwater ecosystem to be. And then they work to leverage their collective energies to make it happen. We also explore what their individual role is in making that vision a reality, because it's very easy for us as individuals to turn around and say, that's what I want to see happen, but it's somebody else's role to make it happen. And what we ask the individuals is, what is your role in making it happen? So it's really important to empower the individual to see that it, they have a role, a significant role in making a difference in their local environment. So look in the mirror and join the men and women who are making a difference as individuals, as leaders who are moving freshwater ecosystem recovery forward. Each and every one of us can play a part. Thank you. The freshwater science team at Conservation International believes that freshwater is our most critical resource. Yet, current action is needed to reverse the decline of freshwater ecosystems. We believe that freshwater conservation can be one of the most effective integrators of climate action, biodiversity conservation, and human well-being. And by making these connections transparent and actionable, greater and faster impact can be achieved. Freshwater ecosystems around the world have some of the highest concentrations of biodiversity on Earth. They also supply a diverse range of critical ecosystem services, for instance, water supply, food production, nutrient rich, sediment deposition, and cultural and aesthetic values. Wetlands, rivers, and lakes, and all the other freshwater ecosystems are intimately linked to climate mitigation. For example, freshwater wetlands only cover 90% of the planet's surface, but they store up to 35% of all terrestrial carbon. Inland streams and rivers, they move vast amounts of carbon from the land to the ocean, acting as carbon's busy transit system. And groundwater systems are very important to secure water for many communities. That is why we are working on innovative restoration actions for freshwater ecosystems that deliver on climate mitigation. However, freshwater ecosystems are at risk. They are undervalued and overlooked, and their rapid loss is undermining efforts to tackle the climate and nature crisis. For example, eutrophication of reservoirs with poor water quality from algal blooms emit much higher rates of methane, a greenhouse gas, than reservoirs with cleaner water. These algal blooms have been associated with excess nutrients that enter water bodies from stormwater runoff, agriculture and industry. Another example is the drainage or destruction of wetlands that can cause significant carbon emissions, such as peatland drainage for the establishment of monocultures. We believe in merging the climate and water agenda for the benefit of both climate and fresh water. We all know that greenhouse gas emissions are increasing and society needs to bend that curve by the end of this decade. Nature, particularly ending deforestation and increasing forest restoration, is one of the most effective solutions to bend that curve. In fact, 30% of necessary emissions reductions can come from the protection and restoration of forests. Currently, there are globally recognized mechanisms for trading carbon credits. Also, 
natural climate solutions for carbon sequestration is mainstream. Furthermore, carbon market continues to grow in volume and prevalence. Therefore, we propose to use carbon market for the benefit of freshwater ecosystems. And this is because climate change is felt through water and local communities are interested in securing their water supply as well as resilience against cycles of floods and droughts. We believe that fresh water and climate is a double force. Local freshwater benefits is stacked and reinforced by the global carbon sequestration benefits. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to save protection and restoration of freshwater ecosystems and hydrologically important terrestrial systems. And it's also an opportunity to align local and global interests. There is so much potential. If restored and protected, riparian forests can preserve water quality, maintain stream integrity, provide wildlife habitat, and control floods and storm water runoff. If conserved and protected, wetlands will continue to home 40% of the world's species, and they will protect us from flooding and provide food and clean water, as well as peatlands, which are type of wetlands, if protected and restored, they can continue to be one of the most important places to restore carbon and to provide water security. Restoration when targeted to key freshwater ecosystems that deliver fundamental benefits to people, including water and food, and flood prevention will, at the same time, provide carbon sequestration. To guide countries to visualize where they have potential to stack freshwater and climate benefits, the Freshwater Science Team at Conservation International is developing maps that overlap irrecoverable carbon and wetlands. An example of that map. This is one of the products produced for the country Zambia, showing that about 40% of the total amount of irrecoverable carbon in that country is located in wetland areas. If these areas are conserved or restored if needed, the country could be achieving not only climate targets but also fresh water targets. Yes, you heard correctly, fresh water targets. This is because we have the Fresh Water Challenge, which is a country-led initiative launched at the UN Water Conference in 2023 to restore 300,000 kilometers of rivers and 350 million hectares of wetlands by 2030. This is the largest river and wetland restoration initiative in history. It is one of the commitments of the UN's Water Action Agenda and aims to leverage political engagement and resources to accelerate adaptation across the world. People need water. Water needs nature. Let's be bold, let's be intentional and focus. Let's develop and implement innovative actions for fresh water and climate. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Maíra Bezerra and I work at Conservation International as the Freshwater Science Lead. Bye bye.
When it comes to restoration, we often think of restoring ecosystems, forests, wetlands, grasslands, but we also need to think about restoring species. This next segment called Restoring Species, Restoring Our Future, explores how to restore one of the most endangered species, the manatees. This segment also explores how to restore nature by stopping the spread of invasive alien species, species that can prevent an ecosystem from functioning properly. Let's listen in. Is it too late to change? Too late to believe? 60% of wildlife has vanished in just 40 years. Less than a century ago, Guadeloupe's last remaining manatee died. Mamondolo, in Creole. The time for action is now. In 2018, a conservation project in Guadeloupe came a whisper away from a world first. Reintroducing a marine mammal to the wild, the manatee. The creature lent its name to one of Guadeloupe's biggest cities and has not been seen in Guadeloupe for nearly a hundred years. In 2016, a national park and its scientists returned two manatees to Guadeloupe's seas, catapulting the project onto the global stage. But without the support it needed, the project floundered and the team was disbanded. Yet the idea lives on. Guadeloupe as a haven for protecting and reintroducing this marine mammal is a dream, but a dream that can come true. The science says we have everything we need to make it happen, but stats and studies are nothing without hope. What if we could change that? What if we could muster up the strength to believe and do our bit? What if everyone around the world became Guadalupian just for the time it takes to dream, to accomplish the impossible and lead the way for the rest of the world? What if for once, humans returned life to the planet? We were all born from water, and to water we shall return, Mamondalo. My name is Natalia Różniewska and I'm a wildlife veterinarian. Uh, in my career I used to work with giant pandas in China, with ocelots in Bolivia, and since a few years I'm focused on manatees project in the Caribbean. We are showing you today this short video to tell you about a very unique project it's about manatees reintroduction in Guadeloupe and it's actually the first of this kind in the world. Manatees disappeared from this part of the Caribbean 100 years ago because they were hunted. And today a very um, amazing opportunity is in front of us because the habitat where manatees used to live is still very well preserved. It's the seagrass beds, the mangrove forest, the coral reef barrier, which makes this place a heaven for manatees. Can you explain us why doing reintroductions? For me as a wildlife veterinarian, the reintroductions are an opportunity to bring health to the ecosystems and therefore to the planet. For example, when I receive a wounded dog, then I will clean the wounds, put the sutures, maybe give an antibiotics, but the healing process, it's actually the body that it's doing it itself. I'm only creating the perfect conditions for the healing to be faster. And for me, when we bring the wildlife and especially the keystone species back to the ecosystems so that they can do the roles uh, that is very specific to them. For example, manatees, they are indicator of healthy seagrass. They disperse seed, they increase the nutrient cycling. So by bringing manatees back to Guadeloupe, we can improve the health of the marine ecosystem and therefore let the nature heal itself and create the perfect conditions for it. Can you speak about 
actions in capture and release? At capture and release, and it actually means capture images release species, we want to bring together science and art in order to raise awareness about biodiversity loss, but also to inspire change and to raise the support for wildlife reintroductions all over the world. Can you talk about Junior and what happened in Guadeloupe with the reintroduction Manatee program? The Manatee project made a huge step forward when it finally moved two manatees from Singapore Zoo to Guadeloupe. It was also a great learning experience for all the team. First, we learned that we can have a successful journey and travel manatees on long distances. The other thing is that one of the manatees adapted very well to the climate and the conditions in Guadeloupe. The other, however, had a very acute kidney disease. And unfortunately, despite the efforts of our veterinary team, this individual died. Since that time, we conducted a veterinary study on captive population and we learned that over a half of captive manatees is suffering from different stages of kidney disease. And because we could improve the nutritional protocol, we were also to save the lives of these animals. Is it easy to do reintroductions? Is there project failures? Wildlife reintroductions are also very challenging projects. And actually learning is a very important component there. One thing is that many species disappeared already a long time ago, at least from human perspective. And therefore we need to learn again how to share the same space with these animals, how to live together, how to use the same resources, for example. And it's especially very important when we speak about carnivores like wolves or bears or um, wild cats that can seem to be dangerous, but there's actually a lot of science and techniques that prove that coexistence between humans and wildlife is possible. The second thing is also that the animals that we are trying to introduce, they have a big learning to do as well. Oftentimes they come from captivity because the founding population is very small. Therefore, these captive and very naive animals have to learn again how to live in wildlife, how to survive. And bringing these animals, sometimes even across the continents, is also very challenging. There are many health challenges. And at the same time, we are using biodiversity in such a speed that we cannot allow ourselves to wait until we have enough data before acting. And therefore, what we can do is to try and stop regularly and think what went wrong and what worked and try to readapt, improve and start again. And I'm sure that by learning and improving, we can succeed the wildlife reintroductions. Natalia, what would you say to people that want to help biodiversity? I think that for all people who'd like to help biodiversity, the very important factor is to actually believe that we can make a change and to keep this motivation no matter what happens. And especially when it comes to failure or mistakes, I think it's very important to keep the vision and the long-term goal of our actions. And also to share what we learn from the mistakes, what we learn from failures and inspire one another. Because it's normal to, to learn, to readapt, to improve our techniques, our projects. But if we believe in it, I'm pretty sure that we can make a change. Did you know that one of the five global threats to biodiversity is biological invasions? This happens when species are introduced by humans and spread into new ecosystems, causing harm to the local environment. 
from the extinction of native species to the loss of ecosystem functions, even leading to health issues and economic costs. The number of different invasive alien species is huge, and they can be introduced to any ecosystem in any region of the world. Yet, despite the severity of the threat, not much is known about biological invasions and their future evolution. Until now, thanks to the Alien Scenarios Project and its innovative approach, the scientists studied all invasive alien species at planetary scale, analyzing very large data sets and developing models to simulate their evolution. The results show that biological invasions increase rapidly in space and time, with the number of invasives, invaded regions and costs growing exponentially. The economic repercussions are particularly tremendous, from damages to infrastructures to impacts on agriculture, forestry, health or tourism. In 2017 alone, they were estimated at $265 billion, more than 20 times the combined budgets of the World Health Organization and the United Nations for that year. Biological invasions are as costly as natural hazards, yet we are not nearly as prepared to face them. We lack mitigation plans, early warning systems, response teams. This is why Alien Scenarios researched the future of invasions by identifying four possible scenarios, ranging from a low decrease to a strong increase in invasions. So, the future will look very different based on the choices we make now, from environmental awareness to intense globalization. Alien Scenarios showed that increasing awareness, adapting legislation and developing prevention, such as biosecurity programs, help manage future invasions, curb biodiversity loss, and prevent major impacts on the environment and human societies. In short, a way to positively influence the future of our world. Participants are actually a mixture of port, uh, biosafety agencies, uh, government representatives, industry stakeholders, solution providers, um, and experts, of course, from all over the world who came together to discuss ways and means to minimize the introduction of invasive aquatic species from ships biofouling in vulnerable marine ecosystems. Biofouling management is very important, not only because it stops introduction of species from one region to another, but in these days where climate change is such a problem, fuel management has to be considered. So having a clean hull and managing biofouling is really important for the conservation and sustainability of the marine ecosystems worldwide.
Para nosotros como Galápagos eh, y la Agencia de Bioseguridad es muy importante la colaboración de organismos internacionales en cuanto al apoyo de, para el sistema y la prevención de especies invasivas. El conocimiento que nos pueden aportar es muy valioso y así tener más herramientas para poder evitar y prevenir la invasión de, de otras especies, de, de otras partes del mundo. ¿no? When you read today's news from almost any corner on earth, it can be easy to lose hope. That's why it's so important to focus on solutions and to replicate successful solutions for restoring nature. This next segment called Restoring Our Future, Restoring Hope features a short video that explains a powerful new approach to specially mapping restoration priorities. The project led by a partnership between the United Nations Development Program and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, has worked with five governments to help identify the most important national priorities. Let's hear all about it from our colleagues in Colombia. Hello, welcome to this space to talk about ecosystem restoration at the Nature for Lives Hub. My name is Enrique Paniagua, and I am a senior policy expert at the UNDP's global program on nature for development. Today, we want to introduce you to the Restoring Hope project, implemented by UNDP and the Convention on Biological Diversity. To understand the importance of this project, we need to understand first the global scenario in which it is being developed, the connection with the global biodiversity framework and the importance of achieving target to on restoration. For this, we have Jamal Anakochova from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity to give us this context. The floor is yours, Jamal. My name is Jamala Nakhlichiba and I'm Forest Biodiversity and Ecosystem Restoration Officer at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Since the adoption of Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, we have been working to help countries to implement Target 2, which aims to bring 30% of degraded ecosystems under the effective restoration globally. We understand well the dimension of the challenge and we keep the current trends in mind. We know that humanity is degrading nature at record rates, that between 20 and 40% of Earth is degraded. One million species are in danger of extinction. 1.6 billion people worldwide depend directly on forest for food, shelter, energy, medicine, and income. But we also know that world urges restoration actions. We need both intact and managed ecosystems to continue delivering the functions and services to support people and planet. We realize that our global economy depends on nature as more than a half of annual global GDP is reliant on natural capital. To support countries in translating global targets into the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity is partnering with many policy and technical agencies. And one of the projects is Restoring Hope, which we are developing with the United Nations Development Program. The project works on a crucial need that we have been trying to address since the IG Target 15, the spatial definition of the areas to be restored. An innovative approach applied in this project integrates biodiversity, climate change, and law degradation variables 
to address the global restoration target more comprehensively. And currently it is a pilot project that we're developing with the experts in five countries. And we're working jointly to create a suitable methodology to measure ecosystem degradation and identify priority areas for restoration. If achieved, the project has great potential to be scaled to more countries that could reap direct benefit from this tool in order to implement it to a national level. We're happy with the initial results, and we have no doubt that this project will constitute an important ladder for advancing global restoration agenda. Many thanks to Jamal for this contextualization. As Jamal points out, restoration is crucial for the global economy. Our economy fully depends on nature. More than 50% of the gross domestic product worldwide depends on natural capital. Depleting nature literally means depleting the economy. And that is the road that humanity has decided to take over the uh, past decades. This is an inflection point in human history. We need to decide whether we are going to take business as usual and collapse our economy and biodiversity, or we enter into a regenerative restoration economy. As a matter of fact, we have no reason to not take the second option. The returns from a regenerative restoration economy are estimated to be worth $125 to $140 trillion annually. That is about 1.5 times the global GDP. So yes, restoring nature means more economic wealth. So what is needed to restore nature? One of the major gaps is identifying degraded areas and restoration priority areas. Besides, we urgently need to coordinate restoration actions among the different environmental agendas to build on each other's efforts and to maximize the financial economy, the opportunities. This is precisely what we are trying to deliver with this project. Identify and restoration priorities that will deliver results for all and increase economic benefits. The project has been well received in all five pilot countries and the results um, of the analysis are proving useful for implementing restoration actions. For instance, in South Africa, a big conservation organization is using the results to develop ecosystem restoration actions at subnational level. While in Colombia, we uh, have performed an in-depth analysis to identify areas for rehabilitation and restoration that the Ministry of Environment will be using to implement the national restoration strategy. To tell us more about Colombia's efforts to restore ecosystems and how the project results are instrumental in achieving them, we have my colleague, Jimena Pujana. She is a sustainable development specialist at UNDP Colombia, interviewing Sandra Vilardi, Colombia's Vice Minister of Environment. Jimena, over to you. Bueno, viceministra, este año en el hub de, de Nature for Life, que eh, va a ocurrir entre el 7 y el 9 de noviembre, vamos a estar hablando sobre la restauración y en eso Colombia pues, ha, tenido, ha sido eh, realmente excepcional en su planteamiento y en la contribución que quiere hacer este país eh, frente a la década de la restauración también. Entonces, cuéntanos por favor un poquito eh, sobre cuál es el planteamiento de Colombia para lograr esta meta de restauración eh, que tenemos en el nuevo marco global de biodiversidad y cómo estás viendo el tema eh, en Colombia. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Sin duda para Colombia y para este gobierno la restauración se constituye en uno de los elementos fundamentales de su planteamiento en el territorio. La restauración no solamente nos va a permitir eh, recuperar esa naturaleza perdida, que es uno de los grandes retos ante la adaptación climática, sino sobre todo la restauración tiene un papel fundamental para reconstruir territorios en paz, para mejorar y aumentar la cohesión social y para poder llenarnos de esperanza 
Así que la restauración es para la esperanza, para la consolidación de la paz, pero también para poder generar una economía productiva basada en esa biodiversidad recuperada. Eh, es nuestra oportunidad para poder hacer esa intersección entre la agenda climática y la agenda de biodiversidad y la agenda de paz. Entonces nos hemos, hecho, nos hemos propuesto una meta sin duda excepcional, histórica en el país, 750 mil hectáreas para poderla restaurar, estar en procesos de restauración en estos cuatro años y en una tarea conjunta con el sector productivo, con las comunidades locales y con los gobiernos locales. Entonces tenemos múltiples fuentes para poder apalancar esta tarea, tenemos, sumamos las voluntades del sector empresarial. Eh, en, en Colombia tenemos sin duda un sector empresarial muy comprometido con los temas de naturaleza. Tenemos leyes también que los invitan a sumar eh, con el tema de las compensaciones por, digamos, por, por el 1% de sus inversiones, pero también hay, hay compensaciones voluntarias. Así que lo que hemos hecho en este gobierno es sumar todas esas fichas del rompecabezas para poder, uno, reconocerlas y dos, aumentar la aspiración. Esta restauración tiene también un fin de poder recuperar esas conectividades claves en territorios del país que están asociados a procesos muy estratégicos del ciclo del agua. Eh, de nuevo reiterando el papel de la restauración en la adaptación basada en ecosistemas. Gracias, viceministra. Y en este eh, marco de este trabajo que está haciendo el país en restauración, pues desde el PNUD y con otros aliados venimos apoyando eh, con el programa Restaurando la Esperanza. Cuéntanos un poco eh, sobre cuál ha sido esa contribución de este proyecto en el trabajo que se desarrolla acá en el país. Bueno, Restaurando la Esperanza ha sido un gran aliado para nuestra construcción de esta estrategia de los próximos años, poder tener ese trabajo técnico de los mapas, eh, unido al trabajo técnico que veníamos recuperando del Plan Nacional de Restauración, actualizarlo, ponerlo a disposición de los diferentes actores, el acompañamiento en las discusiones técnicas ha sido muy importante, yo creo que eh, es una gran alianza, nos ayuda un montón a movilizar eh, la discusión, pero sobre todo aterrizarlo en, en, en territorio con la sofisticación técnica, pero también con la posibilidad de diálogos y organización con los diferentes actores, porque como lo decía hace un rato, la voluntad y el interés de restaurar está convocando a muchísima gente en el país. Entonces, poder trabajar con el programa Restaurando la Esperanza, pues para nosotros es fundamental en esta aspiración de poder tener en proceso de 750 mil hectáreas para el 2026. Muchas gracias, viceministra, y bueno, seguiremos apoyando desde el Perú todo lo que tiene que ver con la década de la restauración y con el clúster de trabajo de Nature for Life. Thank you very much to Jimena and the Vice Minister Bilardi for such a great overview of Colombia's restoration ambitions and the contribution of the Restoring Hope project to achieve the country's priorities. This is all from our side. Should you have more questions or interest in the project, please feel free to contact me at enrique.paniagua at undp.org. Thank you and stay tuned to Nature for Life Hub. We have spent a lot of time exploring different dimensions on how we restore the planet. But let's take a look at how we protect intact ecosystems. The world has made ambitious commitments to protect 30% of the world's surface by 2030. That's just seven years away. One of the biggest challenges will be protecting forests around the world. This segment explores different approaches to protect the forest, including in both hemispheres of the Americas. If not us, then who?
En casi todas las 50 comunidades cunas establece que los jóvenes, sobre todo los que están casados, tienen la obligación de defender la tierra del pueblo cuna. Por lo tanto, cada vez que hay un problema de conflicto, ya sea con los invasores, con los colonos, o para mantener la trocha de los límites que reclaman la tierra, el, el joven tiene la, o, o, eh, o la obligación de participar. El Estado de Panamá hizo límite con Ayala sin consulta a nuestras autoridades, pero siempre el terreno, toda la vida de nuestros antepasados. Así que los jóvenes que están aquí estamos recuperando. Si nosotros no luchamos, ¿qué espera de nuestros nietos? Hay que quedar sin tierra. Por eso. Los cunas vamos a georreferenciar toda nuestra trocha. Nosotros estamos proponiendo una nueva trocha limítrofe uh, y lo vamos a presentar al gobierno nacional. Porque toda esa tierra que, que vemos siempre han sido de los cunas. Desde antes de la, de la creación del Estado panameño. Cunas viven en una isla. Ahora que hablan de cambios climáticos, a nivel del mar está subiendo. Los cunas que viven en la isla, estoy seguro, en 20, 30 años, los cunas, todos van a estar aquí, en tierra firme. Así que por eso estamos preocupados. Si el Estado le quitan, quedamos sin nada. Estamos luchando, si nos quita eso, nosotros de qué vamos a alimentar. Nos van a quitar eh, la carnicería, nos va a quitar la farmacia, nos va a quitar eh, lo, que, lo que producimos, lo que comemos. Y... Y eso es, por eso es que estamos luchando por la tierra. Aquí venimos eh, a patrullar, a ver a los veleros, eh, si están en, en orden. El gobierno de, de Estado de Panamá no le da mucha importancia a, a Comarca Cunayala, porque aquí Usted no lo va a ver en la lancha de, de, de autoridad marítima. Hola, buenas tardes. Somos de la gente de Congreso General Cuna. Entonces nosotros estamos eh, revisando, ah, viendo los, los veleros a todos. Primeramente para preguntar si tenían eh, en pago la entrada de, de Comarca sí, Cuna y Ala. Sí, en, el problema entre Cuna y Ala y mm. Panamá no es nuestro problema. Tú estás entrando a un lugar que tiene su autoridad y son de comarcas Cunayala, entonces ya por eso le estamos cobrando eso, la entrada de Cunayala. Esto, esto no, es, no es nuestro problema, sí. hemos pagado y, y no vamos a pagar más, si no nos vamos. Dale, pues, entonces nosotros nada más venimos de eso y vamos a ir otros veleros que están aquí, va a ver de eso. Bueno, vamos allá al lugar, ve. Calorazo. vamos allá a ver. No sé, si sería bueno mañana. 
por aquí nadie va a venir a apoyarnos. Nosotros tenemos derecho a cobrar nuestras entradas a los peleros que están acá. ¿Dónde está el capitán? ¿Capitán? Capitán. Ajá. Es chino, yo creo que no habla español. Buenas. El barco del Congreso, ¿verdad? Sí. ¿A usted va a pagar? Sí. Más de un mes. Ajá. Nosotros eh, queremos que en el futuro no hay como muchos veleros que están ahora, que nos traen problemas, que los dejan tirado como basurero y también que tiran la basura en el mar. Entonces eso es lo que estamos, eso es lo que me preocupa de esto. Este es un ferry del de un austriaco y encalló el 20 de julio de 2016. Y es un peligro para todos nosotros porque si se escapa el diésel va a dañar todo el ecosistema marino, va a matar la biodiversidad y, los, y las cabañas turísticas ya no van a poder hacer negocio, va prácticamente a, a destruir eh, las playas y los turistas tampoco van a bañar en, en la playa. Eh, uno se siente muy mal, muy ofendido porque el gobierno de Panamá no coopera con el pueblo cuna. Los indígenas eh, defendemos y cuidamos la naturaleza, ya sea en la tierra y en el mar. Y el gobierno solamente piensa en cobrar para su desarrollo del país y el desarrollo de los panameños. Pero no piensa cooperar con los indígenas, en este caso del pueblo cuna, para ver cómo seguimos manteniendo la, 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 la madre naturaleza. Vejo muitas pessoas falando assim, que besteira plantar árvore, dá uma tristeza. There is an urgency to protect what is left. There is an urgency to plant more, to restore more for us. The climate needs it, the world needs it. Quando eu estudava no, na escola aqui vizinha, eu passava aqui em frente à régua, olhava, nossa que lugar bacana, tenho vontade de entrar aqui. E até um dia a escola me chamou para poder fazer uma visita. Eu lembro perfeitamente, quando eu comecei a plantar ali a primeira árvore da minha vida, Eu estou contribuindo com uma árvore, em volta tinha várias. Quando eu crescer, eu quero trabalhar com isso. Why do we restore land? We're addressing three major problems: loss of habitat, the extinction of species, lack of water, water security, and a runaway climate. Quando eu vou na mata, eu acho uma matriz com muita semente. Faça a inscrição dela, aonde que ela está, e quando chegar outro ano. Verifico se ela está com semente. Se ela tiver, eu vou coletar. The science becomes an art because you realize that nature has its own tempo, its own cycle to form seedlings, which then we can take out to degraded areas and start those forests growing again. Tem que fazer acompanhamento como é que está sendo a germinação até chegar o ponto de tirar ela do berçário com todo cuidado e levar até a casa de sombra e plantar cada uma delas com carinho e amor, porque senão não dá certo. Fazer ela crescer, ficar ela bonita, para ir para o reforçamento. 
Nothing can be done in the environment without the support of your local community. The people that work here all are from the local community. Eu conheci Maria né? Para o que eles estão ensinando. E nosso dia aqui é um ensinando o outro. A gente brinca. O dia passa que a gente vem ver. Isso aqui antigamente era pasto. Então para mim isso aqui é um orgulho. Olhar para isso aqui hoje em dia é, é falar assim, hoje tem vida. Minha vida ainda está começando. E eu falo, eu quero me aposentar com isso aqui. Eu vou olhar lá na frente e falar assim, olha, aquela área ali foi, passou pelas minhas mãos, as mudinhas, e olha o tamanho, hoje está maior do que eu. Chego na mata, dou aquela respirada fundo e falo, estou em casa. Hi, I'm Zach Porter, and I'm the Executive Director of Standing Trees, an organization working to protect and restore forests on New England's public lands. We're excited to welcome you to this panel on the value of old forests in New England. In this session, we'll explore why mature and old forests in New England are so vitally important for biodiversity, for the climate, and for our future. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers giving different perspectives on why it's so important to protect and restore mature and old forests in this region. Let's hear from our first speakers, Joe Malouf, founder of the Old Growth Forest Network, and Michael Kelly, executive director of Restore the North Woods. Joan and Michael will share their perspectives on the current status of old forests in New England and the need to rewild forests with a clear view on why public lands are essential to rewilding our forests and ensuring that we have old forests in the future. Let's hear what they have to say. Hi, I'm Joan Malouf. I'm the founder of the Old Growth Forest Network. Hi, I'm Michael Kellett. I'm executive director of Restore the North Woods. And we're here to talk about the role of forests in supporting biodiversity in New England, particularly the old forests. So Joan, uh, why don't you go first here? So you're an old growth expert, and uh, I think people are going to want to hear your thoughts on the status of old growth forests in New England. Where are they headed? What What's the situation? I've been to a lot of old growth forests across America, but the Old growth forests in New England, what I've noticed is how very rare they are. And the, the amount of old growth forests left is measured in tenths of a percent. The other thing I noticed is that there's no laws that protect even these very rare places that are left. And Finally, in my book, doing the research, what I discovered was the biodiversity that's found in these old forests, and that as we've lost the old forests, we've lost the biodiversity. So why is that a problem, Joan? Maybe you can tell folks. The recent report that came out about the wild forests in New England, the Harvard report, um, they are aiming for a goal of 10% of our forests that are wild, meaning they can develop on their own and potentially, hopefully, to old growth forest again. But right now, there's only 3% that's even protected enough to try to reach those conditions. I believe 30% would be better for preserving the biodiversity and keeping our atmosphere and our water quality as high as it should be for the health, not only of humans, but of all the organisms. I can't argue with that. And uh, Michael, tell us more about your work. You've been so involved in rewilding and you started Restore the North Woods 30 years ago. Can you tell us more about your work and your mission? I pulled together with a number of other people who'd been working in conservation for a long time, uh, this new organization, because we didn't think any other, any of the existing groups were doing enough to 
not only protect what we had in New England and, and also across the North Woods all the way to the upper Great Lakes, um, but also that we did we thought someone, some group ought to be talking about rewilding large areas of the region of undeveloped forest in the eastern United States. Uh, let's talk about big wild in in the Maine woods. So that's so we proposed a 3.2 million acre Maine Woods National Park, uh, which would be larger than Yellowstone and Yosemite put together. Maybe you can talk about the old growth forest network. That's working from the grassroots up as well. You're building all across the country. You're building this grassroots support for for old growth forests and, and nature and protecting areas. Oh, yeah. It's amazing how quickly we're growing. So we wanted to save whatever old growth forests were left in the country. And as I just shared, there's not that many. And we wanted to make sure that they didn't disappear. But not only that that some older forests remain unlogged so that they can develop old growth characteristics in the future. So we're speaking for the old growth forests that are left and future old growth forests. And that actually raises the issue, uh, strong permanent protection. 3.3% of New England is protected from logging and other development, but actually only about half of that is permanently protected by law. So it's only a tiny fraction of the region that actually is permanently protected. People see all this forest around them and they think they assume that it's being taken care of. Michael, you raised a good point about public forests because it's really important to protect them because they are our forests. They belong to us. So if we want them to be rewild, at least a percentage of them, then I would hope that we're able to do that eventually. And in building the old growth forest network, we have seen places where then we could step in and make a difference in how the land is managed. Now, there's a lot to be done, but I think we're slowly making progress and we need more people in this movement, as you know, um, to protect forests in their community all over the country. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Joan. Thanks, Joan and Michael, for offering some fascinating perspectives on why protecting and restoring mature and old forests in New England is so critical. Our next two speakers are Susan Messino, professor at Trinity College, and Bill Muma, professor emeritus at Tufts University, and co-author of several of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. They're going to walk us through the role of old forests in sequestering and storing carbon, and help us debunk the myth that cutting down mature forests and replacing them with young trees is good for the climate. It isn't. They're also going to introduce a term, proforestation, fast gaining traction among scientists and ecologists around the world that describes how one of the most efficient ways to capture carbon is to simply let existing forests grow older and more complex. So over to you, Susan and Bill. Hi, I'm Susan Messino. I'm a professor of applied science at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm primarily a neuroscientist, and I've been working at the interface of neuroscience and ecology with a focus on forests. I'm Bill Muma, and I am a professor emeritus at Tufts University and a visiting scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. I have been working on uh, climate uh, for over 30 years, and about half that time on the special role that's played by forests and other ecosystems in removing and storing carbon out of the atmosphere. We're here today to talk about forests and climate mitigation with a focus on the northeastern region of the United States. Susan, I think it would be great if you could talk a little bit about uh, proforestation, what it really means for the climate. Yeah, this is a really important term um, that it's in really important for people to understand. So proforestation is the practice of really protecting existing intact forests for all of the benefits that they offer. Maximal carbon accumulation, biodiversity protection, clean water, and all the things that we need for well-being in our local and global communities. And uh, it's really our essential 
lifeline that we all need. We're surprised to see and pleased to see that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, recognized it as of primary importance for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the uh, sixth assessment report that came out last year. Yeah, I was pleased to see that as well. And there's been so much international interest in the concept of proforestation as a specific term that uh, recognizes the importance of keeping this lifeline of natural systems. And I was wondering, Bill, as the co-author on five IPCC reports, maybe you can talk just a little bit more about the climate benefits. Well, the um, problem we have is that we've been adding so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere uh, that um, uh, we've we've um, trapped so much heat that the Earth is warming up and uh, and actually uh, accelerating warming because as we heat the Earth, it uh, finds ways to add more heat to the atmosphere. So what we need to do is stop putting so much in from all our technologies and from our deforestation, for all the deforestation. Uh, but we also need to um, um, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And uh, forests are the leading means of doing so. Uh, uh, they and the oceans together prevent the uh, increase in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by, by increasing by um, less. Uh, so it increases less than half of what we put in, which is really remarkable. There's just no technology we're talking about that can make that kind of difference. I know one of the the um, issues that's come up is that young forests can sequester carbon faster than older forests. And um, I wonder if you, uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit because people are really getting confused and, and getting the message that cutting down forests is going to help climate change. Uh, if you cut down an old forest, you're gonna release well more than half of the carbon in that tree into the atmosphere right away or soon thereafter. And that negates any benefit you might get from a growing younger forest. It's very misleading to make this argument. Um, and people miss the point that it's not the rate at which carbon is being removed, it's how much carbon is in the forest because that's carbon that's not in the atmosphere. We have to get to certain goals and we need to do it um, as soon as we can, but um, clearly cutting down old trees is is counterproductive. Well, one thing that I'd like to add is that I know a lot of our policies are based on atmospheric carbon, which is not the only greenhouse gas. And the other thing that I always come back to is no matter what the carbon level is in the atmosphere, if we don't protect our local ecology that is protecting our local livelihoods and our well-being and providing the lifeline that then supports our farms and our working forests, then we haven't helped life on earth. I guess the main point I can make is that uh, we really need to uh, uh, protect our our forests uh, and and other other uh, ecosystems, uh, wetlands and uh, grasslands as well. Uh, because they are holding uh, vast amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere, and they are continuing to remove very large amounts every single day. And it is almost ludicrous when you realize that um, we're spending billions of dollars on technologies to remove minuscule amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, when our, for, you know, the biggest one I know of is removing 10,000 tons, which is really remarkable. Uh, whereas um, uh, our um, our forests are removing um, something like uh, like nine billion tons, so it's just no contest. And um, and so we really need to protect those forests and keep them working for us and providing all the other benefits, including the the light we all take when we take a walk in the forest. Well, my final thought would be, even aside from the carbon, we need to protect natural processes because nature provides everything that we need and we need to keep it running for us and for all of the other species on Earth.
Thank you, Susan and Bill, for giving us a lot to reflect on, especially about how we need to rethink the role of mature and old forests as a central strategy for storing and sequestering carbon. But we heard earlier in the session that only a tiny fraction of forests are legally protected from logging, just 3% in New England. The next session explores what we can do to ensure that more public forests are legally protected so they can continue to provide us with all of the benefits they provide today and more, and so that they can be here for future generations to come. We'll hear from Amy Sheldon, a state legislator in the state of Vermont, and from Jim Furnish, retired deputy chief of the U.S. Forest Service. They'll walk us through why we need to rethink forest management on public lands and share some ideas on how to set a bold vision and enact equally bold policies to achieve these goals. Over to you, Amy and Jim. Hello, I'm Amy Sheldon, Vermont State Representative. And I'm Jim Furnish, retired Deputy Chief with the U.S. Forest Service. We are here to talk about the opportunity to protect 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 across the Northeast and the United States. Well, Amy, let's get started. Um, tell me more about the 30 by 30 initiative. In Vermont, we recently passed the Biodiversity Protection and Resilience Act, Community Resilience Act. It sets a goal of conserving 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 and 50% by 2050. It also defines um, what conservation means in terms of the focus being on biodiversity protection. Well, thanks, Amy. Why this bill? Why now? We wanted to uh, set the goals in statute, both for the state of Vermont, which it's estimated has already conserved about 22 to 24 percent of its lands. Um, but we wanted to codify it and make it clear what we meant by conservation of biodiversity. Additionally, we set the goal of 50 percent in Vermont. Um, because we wanted to base it in the science that E.O. Wilson put forward as the challenge in his book, Half Earth. I thought it was really important for us to link our goals to the larger goals and also elevate the conversation across the country and around the world to focus these conservation goals on meaningful biodiversity protection. Well, that's very interesting, Amy. <clears throat> um, I worked for the Forest Service for over three decades when you, when you look at the estate of the national forests, the national parks, the national wildlife refuges, uh, the United States is one of the earliest in the world to devote themselves to setting aside some of these uh, magnificent lands as public in nature and out of the reach of uh, some of the crass commercial exploitation. Uh, they still hold a very important role in uh, the U.S. society, our economy. Um, the ecology. Um, and it's uh, tragic that so much has been lost. I think estimates of uh, the remaining old growth in the United States uh, forests probably range from one to 2%. Uh, so the vast majority has been lost. Interestingly, in Vermont, we've seen the reforestation of the landscape uh, until very recently. And now we're actually seeing um, a, a loss, an annual loss of forested land cover which is heartbreaking in this moment when we know the importance of our intact forest ecosystem in community resilience and in um, our work towards adapting to climate change. Well, I'm very excited about the 30 by 30 initiative because I think it illustrates the hope, the possibility that our public lands, especially federal and state lands uh, can be transformed uh, across the United States and, and really begin to play an important role in uh, addressing climate change through carbon storage and, and ameliorating some of the effects of uh, a warming climate. Uh, it distresses me that I'm, I'm aware that there's still some clear cutting of Vermont's national forest going on. I hope that that can uh, be arrested and uh, we can bring back these beautiful mature and old growth forests to New England and uh, in other parts of the country as well. In Vermont, we've um, established these goals of conserving 30% by 2030 and 50% by 2050. And we're a, a tiny little state, um, but by codifying the goals and creating really clear definitions in statute, 
feel like we are setting the bar pretty high for others to begin to have their conversations, other states uh, in the country and other, and other countries. We'll hopefully look to our legislation for guidance and inspiration and um, the really important role that science plays in having these conversations. And Amy, it was nice to work with you. Uh, I uh, wish you all the best going forward. Thank you for your your courage and your resolve to do some of the right things regarding uh, Vermont, its conservation, its future, its forests. Thank you. And thank you, Jim. It was great to meet you and to um, learn about how important your role has been in helping move the conversation forward at the federal level. Thank you. Thanks, Amy and Jim. You've painted a clear picture as to what steps are needed at the federal level and gave us such a fantastic example from Vermont, the first state in the nation to set legislatively mandated goals for protecting 30% of the state's land area by 2030 and 50% by 2050. Truly inspiring. Our final speaker of the session is Rich Holshu. Rich is a spokesperson for the Elnu Band of the Abenaki tribe in what we now call Vermont. He's here to share his thoughts about indigeneity, of how we need to reframe our understanding of and our relationship to the world around us. Over to you, Rich. Hello everyone, my name is Rich Holshu and I am the founder of the Atui Project. I am of Wontastagak, today's Brattleboro, Vermont, and it's good to see you. In an Beneke sense of being in the world, as I have been taught, there is no time. So when we talk about past, present, and future, they're all the same, and they're all here right now. What we see around us, uh, whether it's in town or out in the forest, is a product of what has happened in the past and of the decisions that were made at the time. And those decisions were made by everyone that was participating, whether they are human or other than human. This is the future as well. It depends upon what we decide to do and what we do with what we have inherited. So when I go into the forest, it's all there and what we decide to do with ourselves, with everyone that's around us, with that forest, will create the future. And so it's all connected and it all matters. In indigenous land relationships, there's no concept of ownership. If anything, the land owns the people. In today's world, that's not the case. Everything is parceled out into individual properties, uh, their respective owners, the rights that accompany it. And uh, common land is best realized in the shape of what we call public land nowadays. Uh, it's held by everyone, uh, ostensibly for the good of everyone. And when I say everyone in my world, that includes other than humans, not just the humans. It belongs to everyone. Public lands fill that role in today's world. If there's going to be any kind of a baseline, of a reference point, of a resting state for us to refer to so that we can figure out what we're going to do in the future, how we're going to grapple with what we have inherited and what we're going to leave to all those who will follow, we need this baseline. We need this um, original condition to the degree that we, we still have it. I think that is best found in public lands, in old growth forests, in mature forests. Uh, we have that, um, that myriad of relationships in place still functioning as best as it can. And we need that as a reference point uh, in order to move forward. Public lands are where that resides, nowhere else. And that's where we have to start. Being a part of a place-based culture, uh, my first priority is this place, the place where I am. I am responsible to this place. 
This place is now called Vermont. And we work through the governmental systems and structures that are in place. The passage in Vermont of the 30 by 30 and then the 50 by 50 uh, initiatives uh, speak to accepting that responsibility, to taking that on. I'm glad to be in a place where we are beginning to grapple with what that might look like. I would hope that that would set an example for uh, everyone else to follow in their respective places. We can only act in the places where we are. And that's our first responsibility. This is a basic uh, understanding in indigenous cultures. In addition to the stories that were shared here a long, long time ago and right up till now, there are other stories current. There are other participants here now. We're all here now. We need to learn from each other. We need to learn these stories. We need to create new stories because the ones that we have right now are not working very well. Thank you, Rich, for reminding us of the importance of place and of considering all the beings, human and more than human, past, present, and future, who dwell in our forests. And thanks to all of our speakers, we've heard so many reasons why old forests are worth more standing and why they are essential for our climate, for biodiversity, and for our future. Wondering how to amplify this message? Here are three things you can do. Number one, Learn more about mature and old forests at standingtrees.org and climate-forest.org. And then follow us on social media to share your thoughts using the hashtags Worth More Standing and Nature for Life. Number two, encourage your legislators to adopt bold visions and bold legislation to protect mature and old forests, especially on your public lands. Number three, get outside and connect with a forest near you. I'm Zach Porter with Standing Trees. Thank you for joining us. Forests provide half of all of our planet's oxygen, but oceans are just as important. When we think of protection, many people think of national parks, but that's not the only way we can protect our planet. This next segment called Protecting Oceans, Protecting Our Future includes a dialogue titled Nets for Net Zero that explores ways to both foster a collaborative circular economy while also protecting our planet's oceans. Let's listen in. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to our discussion today. So develop, developing collaborative circular solutions for abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'll just start off by introducing Nets for Net Zero very briefly. So Nets for Net Zero is an, an organization that was founded in March 2021, so not too long ago. And our goal was really to create circular solutions for abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear in Canada. And along the way, we've developed collaborations with key stakeholders across Canada, such as yourselves, and some internationally as well, to accelerate the global transition to net zero and protect life underwater. So in light of all this, uh, thrilled to have each of you bringing your expertise today to discuss this very important topic and how we can all work together to accelerate that transition to net zero and protect biodiversity. So I'll start by introducing Emily, uh, my co-founder of Nets for Net Zero and CEO at Whale Seeker. And then we also have Sonia Smith. So she is the program management, uh, sorry, program manager for end of life fishing gear uh, at the Fishing Gear Coalition of Atlantic Canada. And we also have Dave Oswald, founder and president of Design Environment and associate professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at Royal Roads University. And then of course we have Marina Petrovic, assistant director at the Fisheries Resources Management National Programs, Department Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, in your current roles, how do you experience the impact of abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear? So let's start with Emily. Thanks, Nina. That's really great. Yes. So um, my I did co-found Nets for Net Zero with Nina, but my my full time job on the side is uh, CEO of Whale Seeker. We we use AI to detect marine mammals 
from imagery. So from satellite imagery, from aerial imagery, from infrared imagery. And our goal is to use ethical AI to really democratize access to these tools for anybody. So we create tools that are powerful enough for the governments and for energy companies, but, but we want to make those tools accessible enough for everybody. So we work with off-the-shelf technology. We, we make sure that all of the data that are collected are owned by the people who collect them. So whether that's a fishing community, whether it's a conservation um, society, whether it's a port, um, we want to make sure that everyone has enough data, finite scale enough data, spatially and temporally to make the best management decisions. And now I'd like to pass it on to uh, Sonia, Sonia Smith yes. for her introduction. Thank you so much, Nina. And uh, so at the Fishing Gear Coalition of Atlanta, Canada, we got started back in 2020 uh, doing research on the lobster fish fishery in Eastern Canada. And that really opened our eyes to the amount of fishing gear that is annually replaced. And it led us to continuing our work under the Ghost Gear Funding Program to design a program to help support um, the fishers across Eastern Canada. So we've been focused on researching, collecting the data um, around the amount of gear that is being used and replaced annually, and then also uh, researching the amount of gear that is lost to be able to come up with an actionable number that we can actually put um, solutions towards. So thank you for the amazing work that you do, Sonia. Um, and I'll pass it on to, uh, to Dave. Um, so my name is Dave Oswald. I'm uh, the uh, founder and president of DE Design and Environment, which is a design and environmental consultancy and tech company uh, founded in 2005, uh, based in Vancouver and Montreal. And our connection to this issue uh, of abandoned gear uh, and its impacts is related to uh, a big core part of our work, which is uh, helping countries um, report to the UN uh, for their uh, obligatory for the parties to these conventions their obligatory reports such as national biodiversity reports their MBSAPs and so forth. So we work a lot on um, data acquisition and data analysis for those reports as well as other conventions, but specific to this issue, it's biodiversity in the Caribbean, um, which obviously uh, has a, a lot of fishing activity going on. So. Uh, our big focus uh, is trying to find the best ways to get data and find out where there are shortcomings of data, uh, data especially in the developing world context, uh, which can be a big challenge. So um, that's really the focus of what we do and then developing tools with which we can uh, facilitate and make it easier for them to do the reports and visualize the data and share the data publicly uh, to the, with uh, open data systems. Thank you for being here today as well. And then of course we have Marina. Hi, uh, Marina Petrovic. I am Assistant Director with Fisheries Resource Management at Fisheries, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, I work at their headquarters and often and have put together, actually put together and lead kind of the, the Ghost Gear program for the department. So it's uh, our team in Ottawa that kind of does all of the um, oversight for the work that's, the great work that's being supported through the Ghost Gear program, um, as well as the Ghost Gear Fund. Excellent. Um, so that brings us to our, our next question. So, you know, talking about all this, what challenges, you know, we know there's always challenges in, in really creating new models, new systems. And so from each of your individual, uh, you know, experiences, expertise, um, what challenges do you see in managing abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear? And, and where can collaboration really play a key role in all of that? So we'll start with Emily. Thanks, Nina. Um, this is a great question. And it's one that we are really up against is who wants to pay for this? Who's going to pay for this? So everyone wants there to be a solution to this. Everyone thinks that we should be working together, that we should be innovating, but who who's going to be paying for it outside of, you know, um, our children and the generations to come about what, what this means for our ocean and what it means for our climate. And so I think that's been one of the, the trickiest parts for us is to really understand all the different players in the system and to see, you know, what is the value of these data that we have, where, where do they fit in um, on a government level, on a private level, um, and then and then just getting all the right actors together so that the cost is also shared by all of the the players. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's been I think that's been one of the trickiest parts for us. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point. And then, you know, on that topic of data, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to to Dave. Um, how 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 do you see, you know, some of the challenges in managing uh, abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear, and you know, getting that data and making sure it's verifiable, et cetera? Yeah, I think there's two challenges. Uh, well, I mean, there's two in my mind. Like I just thought of the two big challenges we face all the time. Number one, speaking to Emily's point about like who pays for it, like who cares. And then get people to care and then once people care maybe they're going to pay for it right that's a big issue for us and you know fortunately we've learned how some of that stuff works but one thing that i found that is a really effective way of getting at decision makers with an issue such as this is using exactly that the, the planetary boundaries model uh, nina that you mentioned before i've used that with bankers in mexico for the mexican banking association and they invited me to come speak about ecosystems and banking and they're like you know they're just there was no knowledge of ecosystems but once i showed them what's going on scientifically and where we're in like the alarm, like fire bell going off problem situation with biodiversity and ecosystems, they kind of woke up and then connected that as well to their core business, which is in that case, in their case is agriculture, but in say in the fishing industry, you could make an argument that's like, we don't take care of this, we're gonna have some problems, you know? So I think that's a big thing is communication and making some sort of schematics or heuristics that make sense to decision makers. And then speaking to your point about data, that's like, okay, we should do something about this. But the next part of that is, okay, well, how do we benchmark our progress in making, how bad is the problem? And then how do we measure our progress in moving forward, which is really the core of our business, really? I would love to dissect all of that. But I think the, the quick you know thing I would say is it just speaks to the, com the complexity, you know, from data acquisition to communicating that effectively. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've definitely seen how communication, uh, I think, you know, regardless of the industry sector you're in or, or what you do on a day to day, how, you know, how a miscommunication can can turn into, you know, something terrible, like it can turn into something amazing. Um, and, you know, right now, I'd like to turn it over to, to Sonia as well to speak, you know, directly from the fisher's perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you speak to fishers, you know, like, daily to say the least um how does this affect their livelihood uh yeah. or you know their day-to-day -day? yeah so you know something that i realized right in the beginning is we've only been targeting aldfg for the last five years right they've been using this gear since the 60s and you know for the wire lobster traps since the you know late 70s early 80s when they started using that gear you know so that right there is a big issue We've only targeted these materials in the last five years, um, you know, so that is definitely a challenge. Uh, minimal commercial scale recyclers exist, very minimal. That's another big issue. Um, inconsistent costs for disposal across Eastern Canada. You know, we have tipping fees as high as $200 per ton. So, you know, very expensive and inconsistent. We have many fishers that fish in multiple provinces. Um, another challenge would be misinformation. So we have many fishers who believe leaving certain types of fishing gear in the ocean creates habitat, protects their species that they fish. Um, so it's just misinformation, miscommunication. They're being, you know, they're learning wrong information. So it's helping them understand um, the correct information. Um, the distance to dispose of their waste. Um, that is a huge challenge for them, um, especially in provinces like Newfoundland because they don't have the right type of infrastructure, waste infrastructure to support all of the fishing communities that exist. Um, and then other concerns would be our lobster market price fluctuations, um, target species population fluctuation and, and migration, new and or costly gear changes, uh, accumulating navigational hazards and gear overlapping issues, um, fisher tensions and moderate livelihood. So these are all challenges that the fishers themselves face and that doesn't matter if you know it's a it's a, a fish harvester or a fish farmer because mm -hmm. they both experience a lot of the same challenges yeah and i can also say you know having gone to india recently and speaking to some fishers there you know we, we know this stuff sometimes on paper but then just speaking to them and understanding their reality you realize you know whether we're right here in canada or across the globe in india it's very similar challenges yes. and there's a you know really big need for for solutions and accelerating some of that um and i think that's a perfect space to turn it over to Verena. you know from a you know regulatory policy perspective how does this come into play Listening to Emily, Dave, and Sonia, it, it it makes it very real because we know from all of these issues, obviously, are part of what we're trying to address, and we're trying to show leadership in this issue. And like Sonia said, we've only really been addressing this issue for a very short period of time. Uh, we've been fishing for generations, right? So there is a lot of 
Dave, you mentioned kind of communication. There's so many levels of communication, right? There's communicating with the harvester. There's communicating in the international uh, realm. There's in, with with industry, with partners, with with all these different folks that have the play that have a stake in this, right? So being mm-hmm. able to establish this came very quickly. Like we began to understand that this is a big issue and it needs to be addressed. And Canada wanted to address it, but we were data deficient. We had never been really the information hadn't been gathered about how much gear we're losing in Canada. Like Sonia was saying, all those challenges, we don't have that information. So we are we're not, it's not, it's difficult to be able to create a policy and regulate an industry when we don't have the proper information. So I'm I'm very proud of the work that we've done to date. And the very first thing we did as when we kind of started this when we went down that road in 2018, 2019, we created mandatory law ski reporting requirements across the board on all commercial fisheries. This is the this was really kind of the bare minimum. We need to know what we're losing in order to be able to address how it's being lost, the reasons for loss, um, and kind of preventative measures to address those reasons for loss. So that was an important a part, an important first step, but Dave, I'm sure you'll appreciate this too. The information we were collecting was through PDF forms. And so there was a lot of room for kind of human induced error, right? We're getting mm-hmm. GPS coordinates, you know, way off in like Toronto, not necessarily where it's supposed to be. So we quickly realized that asking for the data is not good enough. We need to make sure that we're acquiring the correct data and the data that's actually necessary to make these decisions. So we developed the fishing gear reporting system, which again is a it's an application for harvesters that kind of have those check and balances in between. For example, uh, information goes in, it'll pop up a map saying, are you sure that this is where you were fishing? Uh, To make sure that we can catch that in advance, right? And then that information that we've been gathering has been able, we are now able to take a look at where we're, we have certain hotspots and the information we're gathering in terms of the, the cause of gear loss, right? So we can go back to these kind of high gear loss areas and start taking a look at what we can do to address them and identify kind of those areas for, you know, the the fastest response in terms of gear retrieval activities. So, but there is, so that's one source of data, but there is so much other data and information that we need to make sure that we have well-rounded policy to address this going forward. So the information that we're collecting through the projects that were funded through the Ghost Gear Fund have been critical. A lot of the work Sonia is doing, for example, is answering a lot of those questions for us. We need to know what's coming into Canada, how long this gear lasts, where it's being brought at its end of life, what it's made out of, so that we can in fact work with the other kind of federal departmental kind of family to say, Environment Canada, how do we de- develop these types of recycling schemes or uh, provincial disposal opportunities? Like it's it's a collaborative approach with other government levels, with our industries, uh, with our fish harvesters directly, so that we can get all of that information back to us, so that we can use that to feed our policy development. Mm-hmm. So I'd say absolutely, uh, it all starts with um, the data that we need to make those decisions. When we're looking at impact and gear laws, how do we start to measure that? I know that's a huge topic to cover in about a minute, but what, you know, what, would, what would be your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I could start with like what we're seeing right now. So we're seeing right now in the market, if you will, uh, for governance data in the internationally um, with the GBF coming into effect. Uh, there's a big push towards an ecosystem service uh, yeah. perspective, if you will, which I think is amazing as an ecologist and specialized in ecosystem services. So I was glad to see that. I think what we're wrestling with now, and we're actually doing two projects, one with UNDESA and one with the CARICOM on evaluating MEA reporting and trying to figure out where there's data gaps for certain indicators. And this is a perfect example of a very difficult thing to get at, you know, measurement wise. And so we're looking at different modalities, but where we've had success before uh, with, uh, we work with the government of Antigua and Barbuda and government of St. Lucia is uh, in, in heavy collaboration. So when we're doing an MEA platform, like a national environmental information system, we're working with pretty much every government agency in the country that has anything to do with MEA reporting, but also NGOs. Some of the best data that we get for MEA reporting in the Caribbean comes from NGOs. Why? Because they're the ones that get a clear mandate. They get good financing for gathering data and very targeted. The only thing it could be project focused. So there's that heavy collaboration and having a mandate to actually try and figure out the best way to measure that. And the other thing that I think we've experienced some good success with is uh, in Antigua and Barbuda, they explicitly wanted us to make their NEIS public facing. 
So we have an NRI and a National Environmental Information System, and our NRI is their national resource, natural resource inventory, and it's basically an open data platform. We have maps. We have a map. I wish I could show it. We have a map showing the NOAA projections for global sea level rise for 2050 and 2100 that everybody can see. And it's shocking because half of Barbuda is projected to be underwater by 2100. Uh, so it was, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that point and, uh, I'll, you know, for, for some last remarks, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sonia, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, just <laughs> show you yeah, like <laughs> my mind's just like really here, just like listening to everybody yeah. else. But based on the research that we did at the FGCAC, you know, we determined that there was over 280. 3,000 lobster traps replaced annually, along with 3,000 tons of rope in Eastern Canada. And that's what, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, like, and that was, and what we, we only looked at the most difficult waste that they generate. We didn't look at all the other ways from all the other, you know, fisheries. We only looked at lobster to start with because we knew it was the most complicated waste. And after collaborating with, you know, 50 plus stakeholders, you know, uh, rights holders, uh, you know, other NGO organizations, um, you know, what we realized is that, you know, we have to create a program to support them. Something yeah. That will and and it has to be a program that can be the same in every province, you know, and support them based on the waste that they're generating. Yeah. And so that's what we did. We as a result of that, we designed a product stewardship program. And we've been, you know, and and we've been running our study of that. And and this year we're just, you know, collecting based on hur Hurricane Fiona. But in our previous years of collection, you know, we've set up 26 uh, collection sites across Eastern Canada. Um, we've collected to date over 3,800 tons of fishing gear waste. Um, and that is such a huge milestone because it's showing the fishers that we are here to help them and support them. And we want to, you know, move forward with setting up a permanent program for them. But the only way to have a successful program is to have a regulated program. Because as we know, not all of the industry members, you know, want a program because there's a cost that's associated with having any kind of a program, um, you know, but the majority are so excited that there could be something in the future that will really support them with managing this waste. Because the bottom line is, is they don't want to landfill it. They don't want to burn it. They don't want to discard it or even stockpile it in their backyards. They want to responsibly manage it. And if it can come back to them, you know, in the future, if we're able to recycle some of those materials into new, uh, you know, products that can be used in the industry, like they're even more excited to learn that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, I think, to all of you for your thoughts, uh, your leadership, uh, you know, within your current roles, everything you do. You know, you don't do this work if you're not passionate about it. Um, so it's been fan a fantastic discussion. I know we'll have many more online, offline. And so, yeah, just a really warm thank you to each of you for, for being here today. Our last segment today looks at how we need to protect species. This segment includes lessons from different approaches in protecting tigers and birds, as just two approaches to species protection. It also includes a video on something we might not always think about. Protecting the people who protect species, the park rangers who often put their lives on the line. Let's get started. In a world filled with beauty and diversity, there's a majestic creature that stands out above all, the tiger. Tigers once roamed vast areas, from as far west as Turkey to the forests of Siberia. But today, the range has shrunk to less than 3%. The threats they face are immense. Habitat loss, climate change, poaching, human wildlife conflict, as a result, tigers are an endangered species and are hanging on by a thread. But why should you care? Because this story isn't just about tigers. It's about us and every living being on land. The protection of tiger landscapes is tied to the health of our planet. Protecting tigers extends protection to large swaths of forest that capture and store carbon, to vital water sources 
that provide fresh water to millions of people across Asia and to natural resources that provide indigenous people and local communities with livelihood options and contribute to the global economy. In a world of quick fixes, tiger conservation needs long-term vision, a paradigm shift from quick gains to lasting legacies. Tigers need investments that match the ambition of the global conservation goals. We now have a decision to make about the future of tigers, their landscapes, and more than 100 million people who depend upon these areas. Will we continue the hard-won upward trajectory achieved over the past 10 years, or risk a downturn from which tiger recovery and societal well-being would be far more expensive, if achievable at all? Key players in tiger conservation and global finance will be attending the Sustainable Finance for Tiger Landscapes conference in April 2024 under the royal patronage of Her Majesty the Queen of Bhutan, Jetsunpema Wangchuk. The conference will be hosted by the Royal Government of Bhutan and co-organized by the Tiger Conservation Coalition. The conference will align with national and global agendas on climate, biodiversity and One Health. It will inspire collaboration and leverage innovative financing opportunities to deliver conservation impact at scale. The time for action is now. Rangers are nature's first responders and should be recognized as essential planetary health professionals. Whether state, regional, communal, indigenous, or private, they play a crucial role in protected and conserved areas, where they are responsible for safeguarding natural, cultural, and historical heritage, and protecting the rights and well-being of future generations. But the job of a ranger often means they face difficult and dangerous situations, especially those rangers on the front line. They may encounter poachers and other criminals, including potentially armed groups whilst on patrol. In other cases, rangers might also have to support rescue missions, fight fires, or prevent human wildlife conflict, and in so doing, risking and sometimes even losing their life. Despite the incredible job that rangers around the world do, and the incredible difficulty of their job, the provisions in place to safeguard their interests and safety often falls short of providing meaningful response and protection. So many rangers have very little or inadequate equipment. They sometimes don't receive their salary for several months and lack the recognition and respect that other frontline workers receive. This situation needs to change and it needs to change urgently. The Universal Ranger Support Alliance has developed a five-year action plan in partnership with the International Ranger Federation and many other conservation organizations to build an accountable, equitable, responsible, and inclusive workforce, which is absolutely critical for the delivery of Target 3 of the Global Biodiversity Framework. The principles for ranger rights and well-being is an integral part of that process. These principles help to make sure that range of working conditions are improved and rangers feel safe and secure in delivering their duties. The principles were developed in collaboration with the Universal Ranger Support Alliance and the International Ranger Federation. Our team at Asesoramiento Ambiental Estratégico first reviewed the available literature to better understand the situation of rangers and the dangers and difficulties they face. That information was then consolidated and further refined by two workshops, where experts on social safeguards, human rights and rangers, as well as employees from the ranger workforce itself, provided their expertise and insights into what it is that rangers around the world need. The result of this process are 10 principles that adopt a human rights-based approach while also fostering trust with vulnerable individuals and groups rangers come into contact with. The approach taken is two-pronged, as the principles aim to, on the one hand, proactively prevent or minimize situations where the safety of rangers or those they interact with could be compromised, 
and on the other hand, reactively address instances in which rangers or people they interact with did not feel safeguarded. The first principle is ensuring rangers have a clear mandate and role. A lack of clarity in what authority rangers have to act in a certain way and what is expected of them can result in difficult and even dangerous situations that need to be avoided to the extent possible. The second is acting within and respecting the code of conduct, as this encourages a discipline and empower workforce and maintains high standards of practice and ethics and provides valuable guidance for rangers to make better work decisions. The third is securing equality and non-discrimination. Discrimination and unequal treatment are unfortunately not uncommon within the ranger workforce, particularly when it comes to gender. Potentially as a result, it is estimated that women constitute only 3 to 11% of the workforce. The fourth is ensuring due process and access to effective remedy, both judicial and non-judicial. Rangers, just like everyone else, should have access to due process in case they are accused of misbehavior and to effective remedy in case they are wronged or are involved in accidents during work operations. The fifth, the fifth is enabling access to information and participation so that rangers are aware of important information regarding their job and can participate in decision-making processes affecting their working conditions, role and mandates. The sixth is supporting ranger welfare through good employment conditions and ensuring they have, for example, a minimum acceptable remuneration and are provided with life and health insurance as well as appropriate equipment and mental health support if needed. The seventh is promoting integrity in the workforce. And here superiors and organizations employing rangers can play a key role by leading by example, demonstrating the strong moral principles and showing respect, appreciation and support for all the members of the workforce. The eighth is fostering transparent and effective collaboration which can also help find solutions to range of community problems by having an understanding of the community's needs and efforts and its capacity to partner in, in conservation. Ninth is building and consolidating mutual respect, which is essential to have good relationships, not only with colleagues, but with local community members and visitors as well. And the 10th is conferring and exercising responsible authority to ensure that both rangers and those in charge are accountable, exercise good judgment, and stay away from corruption. For all these principles, we also developed a guidance document and a planning tool for organizations working with or employing rangers to facilitate implementation of the principles. And the aim now is to pilot these products, thereby start the implementation phase and learn and improve the documents as we go along. For any questions on the documents and the topics raised, please feel free to get in touch using the contact details shown. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. Hello, I'm Alfonso Hernandez, Program Manager at BirdLife International. Achieving the Global Biodiversity Framework's Nature Positive Mission requires urgent action at scale including through delivery of both the quantitative and qualitative aspects of the 30 by 30 target. I will showcase and share learning from our nine country, 100 sites, Conserva Aves program in Latin America, which taking action, taking a local to global approach, connects sites across countries, ecosystems, and empowers local people. Conserva Aves is an initiative led by, by four organizations, American Bird Conservancy, National Audubon Society, BirdLife International, and the Latin American and Caribbean Network of Environmental Funds, and supported by the Bezos Earth Fund. But let's start from the beginning. What is Conserva Aves? This is a new initiative supporting the creation, expansion, expansion and management of new subnational protected areas to safeguard threatened endemic and migratory birds on those areas managed by indigenous people and local communities. This is a participative, inclusive initiative 
and we're trying to make it as dynamic and versatile as possible to be adapted to the different geographies where it will be implemented. And we're doing this side by side with a network of national partners, bird life partners, and partners from the Latin American Caribbean Network of Environmental Funds. And our goals are the creation of at least 100 new local protected areas to cover at least 2 million hectares in nine countries in Central and South America. And this is based on a successful model named Conserva Colombia, which during the last decade it was able to support the creation of more, of more than 90 new protected areas in Colombia. And we are also supporting the countries in achieving their 30 by 30 target. And why do we have a hemispheric approach? Well, now it is known that, that more than 3 billion birds have been lost since the 1970. Uh, we have almost 600 uh, threatened bird species in Latin America, and habitat continued disappearing in some cases at an alarming rate. And this is the model of Conserva Aves. We're working with indigenous and Afro-descendant people, local communities, rural communities, NGOs, and in some cases with local governments. And we have two different project granting mechanisms. The first one is a public request for proposals. The second one is a direct strategic investments. And all the projects are expected to have these three components. First, designation or expansion of a protected area at subnational level. Uh, the creation of management and sustainability plans in one to two years of implementation of such plans to eventually have effectively managed protected areas. And at the same time, we have a capacity building or knowledge exchange component in the monitoring, evaluation, and learning one to adapt and to um, learn. During the first stage, Conserva Aves, the team has been focusing in four countries in the tropical Andes, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, with an initial investment of $12 million from the Bessos Earth Fund and $7 million in co-funding. Now, let me talk to you about the progress in these first 20 months of initiative in these four countries in the tropical Andes. First of all, the team was detecting and identifying the priority sites for the conservation of these threatened bird species. So this is an example from Colombia. Those red colors indicate priority sites. And this was carried out through a quantitative geospatial analysis to detect gaps in bird conservation. This is the first project granting mechanisms, mechanism, the request for proposals. And in this regard, it was already launched in Colombia in October last year, where 35 proposals were received, 12 of which were approved. Now in Peru, we launched two months ago, 21 proposals were received, and all of them are under review. And in Bolivia, the initiative just launched last week. And this is for the second uh, project granting mechanism, the direct strategic investments. For this one, 20 projects have been identified and approved in four countries. And this is just an, an example, what you can see on the uh, right side of your screen, the Montañerito Paisa Reserve, which is a critical endangered bird species in Colombia, for which a new protected area has been created in Northern Medellin. In terms of the knowledge exchange for IPLCs, This component has already started. Uh, this entails working on the ground with local communities, with our local partners. And for this, we already have an online course, course on protected area management, a protected area creation and management manual for each one of these countries, and a personalized supporting scheme for each one of these local partners, which is um, around protected area creation, bird monitoring, communications, safeguards, protected, manage, protected area management, uh, project management and financial sustainability among different and other topics that are required, required depending on local partner 
needs. And this is an example of one of those uh, manuals. This is the one for Colombia. You can scan and download this manual using the QR code on your screen. And in summary, we have 32 projects in four countries covering more than 330 hectares for threatened and declining bird species and working with 25 local partners. The next steps are, first of all, to launch the request for proposals in Ecuador, to continue with direct strategic investments, to continue with the capacity building and knowledge exchange component, and the monitoring, evaluation, and learning one. And this is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Please visit our website. You can see what is going on in the initiative by scanning the QR code on the top right of your screen. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of day one of the Nature for Life Hub. If you missed anything, don't worry. You can always come back and find all of the content from today's show at natureforlifehub.org. And be sure to check out our Action Center for more information on how to be part of this movement. Thank you very much for joining us today and see you next time.